Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Victor McTeer, class of 1969, uh, and one of the first African-American graduates of uh, Western uh, Maryland College, McDaniel College. Richard, are you there? Jose, Marty, and Gwen, can you all introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, my name is Richard Smith, and I'm an associate professor here of sociology. Also, I'm the special advisor to the provost, and also class of, of 2000. So I'm so thankful to be here with you today. Hello, everyone. Morning. My name is Jose Marino. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at McDaniel. Just started my fifth year, and it is a pleasure to be with you all. Good morning. I'm Marty Hill. I'm a member of the WMC McDaniel Board of Trustees, and I've served in that role since 1993. Good morning, my name is Gwen Coddington and I'm the Archivist and Special Collections Librarian at Hoover Library and I just started my second year. Gwen, could you go ahead and let's begin with a brief history of diversity on the Hill. All right. Uh, Heidi, can you start the PowerPoint whenever you're ready? Western Maryland College opened in the fall of 1867 as the first co-educational college south of the Mason-Dixon. When the first class graduated in 1871, it included four men and three women, all of them white. It would take almost 100 years for the first black students to arrive on campus. In September of 1886, WMC welcomed its first student of color. Miseo Suni Harata came from Japan and she graduated in the spring of 1890. She is pictured in the photograph of the library on the right, standing near the back. In the mid-1920s, Yosio Ito attended the Westminster Theological Seminary and became a frequent guest speaker at WMC. A decade later, Tani Takahashi would also make the nearly 7,000-mile journey from Tokyo to Westminster. She would graduate from the college in 1941. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. That next year, the Board of Trustees voted not to accept any Japanese American students who applied to the school. The board reversed this decision in 1944 with the provision that they preferred the Japanese students to be women and Methodist. As of 1944, there were still no black students, no black faculty or alumni on the college. Now that's not to say that black folk weren't involved in the college. They were quite a familiar sight since its inception as maids, janitors, field hands maintain beautiful existing grounds, and as laborers. Education was not for them. It seems as though, in part, the reason for their lack of uh, uh, involvement in the college on an educational basis was due to the Westminster practice of excluding people of color from work opportunities. Since the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Black folk and white folk in the Carroll County, Westminster area were basically at war with each other over the issue of who would do what work. There were a number of black tradesmen who were now free to work as they saw fit, but they competed with white workers and that was not taken well by the whites in charge. The college had a policy at that time of not allowing black athletes from Northern schools to compete at Westminster activities. This is of course after the college's founding in 1867. By that time, McDaniel had become, or Western Maryland had become quite a football power. And in 1941, even though there were still no black uh, athletes on the team, the college had a practice and a policy established in 1939 of not allowing black athletes from northern schools, northern schools to compete in Westminster. In 1941, Boston College and WMC played a football game in Westminster. And when the college, Boston College came to Westminster, two African-American students from Boston College, Charlie Thomas and Howard Mitchell, broke that color line and participated in a game where Boston College defeated the national power Western Maryland College, 14 nothing. In 1946, the student government petitioned the trustees to allow the college to host interracial conferences. 
the proposal was popular among students, but ultimately was turned down by the Board of Trustees. There was change afoot in America at the time, and shortly thereafter, Jackie Robinson born, born, uh, joined the Brooklyn Dodgers in Major League Baseball in 1947 through the inspired leadership of uh, Branch Rickey. President Truman desegregated the military in 1948. In 1949, things started to change at WMC when the college agreed to host the Baltimore Colts Summer Camp, the summer training camp in Westminster. This was an amazing event, if only because of the fact at the time, the Colts and other professional football teams had a practice of not allowing the white and black players to room in the same places. In other words, when they would go to games over either in Baltimore or elsewhere around the country, they basically stayed in segregated housing. Here on the Hill, however, there was no such requirement, at least to the best of our knowledge. By the 1950s, records indicate that students had begun to ask the college to admit black students. In 1952, the school paper criticized the school's refusal to serve a black patron at the grill where the food was being served by black cooks. The paper called for an immediate change to the college's policy. 1954 witnessed the landmark decision of Brown versus the Board of Education, which struck down racial segregation in public schools. At a faculty meeting in 1955, Dr. Charles Crane, a professor of religion, urged the college to actively recruit African Americans. No comment followed for support or opposition, but other concerned faculty believed Dr. Crane was privately reprimanded for his statement. Records reflect repeated incidences of students demanding that Blacks be admitted to WMC. The common response of the school's president, Lowell Enzer, was to claim that there was nothing in the college charter, nor issued from the board of trustees, that strictly prohibited the admission of Black students. Whether the school admitted Black students would be decided if one applied. An issue began to arise, however, in the early 60s, pertaining to the Baltimore Colts' efforts to bring Black ball players and white ball players to the college for their summer practices. Protests ensued after the families of Baltimore Colt members, uh, Black families of black, uh, black Baltimore Colt members, were denied access to hotels, restaurants, or to shop even in downtown Westminster. Eventually, protests began. And among the protesters was a young minister from Western Maryland College. His name was Ira Zepp. Joining with other activists with the NAACP, they eventually were able to force an in, uh, a resolution of the matter through the agreement that in fact, blacks would be allowed to go to local restaurants, hotels and restaurants, excuse me, hotels, restaurants, and uh, um, uh, other areas of public accommodation. It was the first time in Westminster history that black folk would be allowed to enter into activities uh, among the community. By 1963, President Enzer affirmed that the college would accept applications from black students. In fact, the school had accepted unnamed African Americans into their summer programs. By 1962, two unnamed black applicants had been considered for admission into the regular academic year. One was a transfer student from Howard University who was given admission into WMC, but ultimately did not attend. The admissions committee refused admission to the other applicant over concerns about her academic record. As President Enzer would describe, the committee wanted there to be no doubt regarding the qualifications of the first African-American accepted to WMC. To the best of our knowledge, we found no similar reference to white students to be admitted to WMC. In the fall of 1963, the first two black undergraduate students enrolled. They were Charles Sebrin and Raphael Mayamona. Sebrin was a Baltimore native and transfer student from Morgan State College. Mayamona was a Congolese exchange student who had been attending high school in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Sebrin would withdraw after one year, but not before he was elected president of the freshman class. 
Mayamona would go on to complete his education at WMC and become the college's first black graduate in 1967. The next year, Joseph Smothers, age 18, and Victor McTeer, yours truly, age 16, enrolled at WMC, both from Baltimore, Maryland. They were students who were recruited by WMC alumni at their respective schools, Baltimore City College and Forest Park High School in Baltimore. Both would graduate in 1969 as the college's first American, uh, African-American graduates. Joe Smothers earned a degree in physical education and McTeer graduated with a degree in political science. They, in their first year, were the first two African-American students on campus, on a campus of 800 individuals, none of whom, with the exception of Raphael Mayamona, were members of the black race. In the fall of 1964, the college admitted Charlene Williams, its first black female student, also from Baltimore. Williams graduated in 1970 with a degree in dramatic arts. College activism also became very, very popular in social justice issues on campus. Of the 176 people employed by the college when Joseph Smothers and Vic Mateer were in their junior year, 43 were black, 133 were white. All of the 43 black employees served in either dietary, maintenance, or custodial positions. Obviously, things had not changed much in the college from 1867, where again, blacks largely served as dietary, maintenance, and custodial partners in the college. However, in the social justice world, there was Operation Push, excuse me, Operation Hinge, and the Student Opportunity Service, two groups founded by um, Ira Zepp and Earl Griswold, a sociology professor at the college, in order to have the college actively pursue social justice activities around the world. In 1969 and 70, Perrin J. Mitchell, the first African-American congressman from Maryland, joined the sociolo sociology and political science department part-time as the first black faculty member. Three years later, in 1973, the Black Student Union was formed on campus. In 1976, Barbara Craig joined the WMC staff as the Assistant Director of, Admi of Admissions, making her the first African-American hired at the college in an administrative position. In 1977, WMC hired Henry Miller III as Assistant to the Registrar, the first Black staff person. The college at that time had approximately 32 black students on campus. In 1979, Professor Charles Neal became the first African-American at WMC, hired in a tenure track position. Professor Neal would stay with the political science department for 34 years, retiring emeritus in 2014. It took 110 years for a black to become a tenure track professor at Western Maryland College. During the 1980s, the BSU expanded Black History events from a week to a month-long celebration. The BSU helped bring in more Black academics, artists, and activists to speak on campus. Some of the speakers from this decade include Carol Simpson, ABC reporter, U.S. Congressman and former WMC lecturer Perrin J. Mitchell, Yolanda King, civil rights activist and daughter of Martin Luther King Jr., and feminist and civil rights activist Jane Galvin Lewis. In 1986, 119 years after the college's first board of trustees met, Kurt Smoke became the first African American to serve on the board of trustees. He would also become the first African American mayor of Baltimore, Maryland. It's important to note that the board of trustees provides all policymaking and governance actions for the entire college community. The implications of Smoke's role is extremely important as the first person of color to serve in that position. He was followed subsequently in 1990 by Joseph Smothers, one of the first graduates of the college, and then by Wayne Curry in 1990 also. Curry would become famous as the first uh, chief administrator of uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, uh, in, uh, in, at an earlier period of time. 
As the college entered the 1990s, Professor Neal remained the only full-time Black faculty member 11 years after he was hired. In 1991, WMC hired its second full-time African-American professor, Glenn Caldwell, in the music department. Throughout the decade, the retention levels of Black students remained low. The school paper reported that of the nine years from this decade with available da data, eight of them had graduation rates of Black students at 50% or below. In 1999, the college witnessed its most successful graduation rate of the decade when seven of the 13 Black students who enrolled in 1995 graduated. In 1994, 95, and again in 98, incidences of hate crimes and racist propaganda rocked the college. Students reported receiving racist and anti-Semitic mailings through campus mail. Racial slurs were found scrawled on buildings around campus and in one case burned into the grass on the golf course. The events triggered outside investigation from both the Baltimore County Police and the FBI. On campus, the administration put forth statements condemning the acts and showing support for minority students. The college also held a candlelight vigil, which was attended by hundreds of students, staff, and members of the community. In 1997, the college introduced the first full-time directorship for the Office of Multicultural Services, led by James Felton. The creation of this position paralleled similar groups that came into existence around this time. In the fall of 1990, the Black Alumni Chapter for the college was established. The Hispanic Latino Alliance, Asian Community Coalition, and Progressive Students were also formed in the 1990s. In 2001, the Hispanic Latino Alliance orchestrated the college's first celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month. In 2001, 134 years after Western Maryland was founded, the college hired its first two African-American women as full-time professors. Professor Psyche Williams Forson entered the English department in 2000 as a Jesse Ball DuPont scholar. The DuPont program was a pilot program for African-American educators. After the completion of her first year, she was offered a tenure track position. Professor Roxana Harlow joined the Department of Sociology in 2001 and helped launch African American Studies as a minor. The school witnessed a surge in minority enrollment during the first few years of the new millennium. In 2002, the percentages peaked with 21% of the freshman class composed of minority students. Through the latter half of the decade, the percentages tapered off again, dropping to a low of 10.4% in 2005. In 2010, McDaniel College launched the Asian Studies Department. Seven years ago, it welcomed the first of its four Divine Nine Greek organizations. The Divine Nine are Greek fraternities and sororities founded by African Americans in the early 1900s. Zeta Phi Beta arrived on campus first in 2013, followed by Omega Psi Phi and Alpha Kappa Alpha in 2016, and finally Alpha Phi Alpha in 2019. Throughout the last decade, nationwide incidences of police brutality against Black citizens shocked students on campus and ignited a stream of activism. Students held candlelight vigils in remembrance of Eric Garner and Freddie Gray, both of whom were killed by police. In the fall of 2016, despite formidable opposition, eight student athletes on the football team knelt in protest during the national anthem in a movement inspired by NFL player Colin Kaepernick. When asked about their decision, the players expressed their hope that their actions would raise awareness about racial inequality and move the community towards change. By 2020, the entire NFL, NBA, MLBA, NHL, and members of all professional sports, including NASCAR, would join in the protests. 30 years ago, Dr. Ira Zepp, the mentor of many students in this college, including myself, wrote down his vision of the Western Maryland College for 2020. One third of the student body would consist of students in co of color, he said. The college would have its first non-white president, he said. Every student would be fluent in Spanish before they graduated as, quote, we should be able to speak the language of our nearest neighbor south of the border and the largest minority in our country. The academic program, he claimed, would be de-Europeanized, Europeanized, and the school would have majors in both African and Asian studies. In 2014, students of color made up 19% of the undergraduate body, 
Today, there are 37%. The impact of the death of George Floyd was substantial to this community as well as academic and other communities across the nation. It brings to mind certain realities. We have never celebrated the contributions that have been made by both whites and blacks in this community to the concept of diversity. Perrin Mitchell, the first black uh, faculty member of this college, became the first congressional member of Congress in Maryland after being an adjunct professor at Western Maryland College and Morgan State. Wayne Curry became the first African-American chief executive of Baltimore, Maryland after graduating from Western Maryland College. Kirk Smoke, the first member of the Board of Trustees, would become the first black mayor of Baltimore, uh, Maryland after being and while being a member of the board of this college. James Felton he would become a DEI executor of the year after graduating, or excuse me, after attending and working at McDaniel College as an, as an executive and staff member. David Carrasco would become at Harvard University one of the leading experts on Hispanic culture after graduating from Western Maryland College. Unsung heroes like Charles Kane, Dr. Charles Kane, who suffered a possible problem after daring to speak up in the 1940s for the recruitment of black individuals as students at the college at a time when blacks commonly worked only as cooks and maids or janitors would of course be part of the cadre of individuals who have served the interest of diversity in this college. And of course, our mentors, Ira Zepp, Earl Griswold, and others, the student protesters of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 90s should be remembered in terms of all that we have done, that they have done for the benefit of the concept of diversity. McDaniel has much to be proud of. We are attracting today large numbers of people of color with vision who wish to become part of our family. Our retention rates are superior to the national average for people of color. But not only that, if one looks at the last nine, excuse me, nine years, and only two of the last nine years have white retention rates exceeded the retention rates of people of color on this campus. We are fast becoming a majority minority institution. We are proud of who we are and what we have become and what we will become. The board has made substantial investments that to uh, admit a growing number of people, both first generation and people of color, as well as to fairly bring people into this college on the basis of merit. We must be concerned with the so-called coming demographic cliff. It's shown that birth rates are down during this pandemic year, meaning that the pool of students will be lower and lower in years to come, particularly within an 18 year period as the smaller group of individuals create the pool in this year of individuals who will 18 years from now attempt to enter the college troop pool. But the same was true in 2008 when there was a depressed number of children born, meaning that there will be a academic cliff, a lesser number or decreasing number of individuals who will fit the pool of individuals who will join the college family by 2026. Another fall of this birth rate means that we should be prepared for the fact that we will be competing for fewer and fewer students. McDaniel has been well placed for this reality. We continue to grow our base of students, even in the midst of pandemic of a pandemic community. We have continued at this point in time to meet our goals and expectations for the number of students to bring in. That is a good thing. We are continuing to decolonize our curricula and that we must engage in efforts that attract these communities that we seek to serve 
to this institution. We must build safe spaces for all students, and particularly for students of color who have suffered from problems related to race on campus for some time. We have to hire additional staff, reflecting our intent to have a diverse employment opportunity for all people, and particularly for people of color who have been limited historically to positions as janitors, as maids, as cooks. We have to learn to speak a common language that's respectful to all, grow leadership for our board, hire people of color, and making it known that this is a safe space to pursue concepts of anti-racism, opposing the historical use of favoritism in order to maintain the stigma of limited opportunity for people of color. These are but a few of the challenges that we're facing in this trepid and, and, and difficult time. But we trust that with understanding of our history, we can move on to a brighter and a better future. Thank you so much for that wonderful history, Vic and Gwen. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I didn't get to introduce myself earlier. My name is Janelle Covage. I graduated from McDaniel uh, with my bachelor's in 2014 and again with my master's in 2016. And I currently lead the DEI advisory group consisting of alumni and faculty and staff. Um, I'd also like to give Lily an opportunity to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, um, I am Lily Carpenter. My pronouns are they, them, she, her. I am a 2015 grad of McDaniel College. I played um, lacrosse at McDaniel and I'm currently working on um, getting my uh, firefighter one and two certificate, EM, EMT certification. So that is my career now. Great, thank you. We'd love to know who's joining us today. Um, so if you would like, please introduce yourself in the chat with your name, what year you graduated and where you're joining from. Um, as you can see, a couple of us are joining from our cars today, which I think speaks to um, our new normal that COVID-19 has brought for us. Um, and it's great that we have people joining from across the country. Um, so I'd like to, uh, allow Vic to talk a little bit more about his experience. Um, I've had some really profound conversations with Vic and he's a really important part of McDaniel's history. Um, and he, Iris Epp had a really significant impact on him. Um, and one thing that really struck me in my conversations with Vic is his observation that alumni, especially alumni of color, typically have a period of separation from McDaniel. So they graduate and then there's usually an extensive period uh, before they return to reconnect with McDaniel. And when I sat and reflected on that, because that was true of my experience as well, um, it really made me think about healing and reconciliation because I think part of that period of separation uh, probably speaks to some of the experiences that alumni of color have had uh, at McDaniel. And a lot of those experiences may be painful and could be contributing to that period of separation. Um, so Vic shared a really wonderful story of reconciliation and I'm hoping that he would be willing to share that again today. I was really stunned after I became a member of the Board of Trustees to learn that uh, many of the things and situations that I had gone through in 1965 through 1969 were still happening to people of color in the 1990s and uh, thereafter. Ira Zepp helped me get through the experience of being a 16-year-old in an all-white college with the exception of uh, two other uh, people of color. Um, he was not just a friend, he was a confidant, and particularly in bad times when I felt demeaned, uh, unable to uh, communicate uh, in a place where there were people who just didn't understand what it was like to be the sole, one of the sole black students 
at an all white campus at the same time that none of them had ever had the experience of doing likewise on an all black campus and wouldn't think to do such a thing. Um, I had really, there's no way other way but to say it. I was, I was so disgusted with my experience in Mississippi that, I, excuse me, in, 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 in at, at, at Western Maryland that I just decided I had to learn how to do something that could uh, rebut, change, alter this course of my life uh, in what I seemed to think was an all white world. And I decided that I wanted to become a civil rights lawyer. And it led me of all things to use the student opportunity service to go to Mississippi. Uh, and it was there that I found a career as a Mississippi trial lawyer and where I was managed to escape the horrors of what I felt that I had experienced at McDaniel. It was Ira Zepp who would also suggest through his wife, Mary, while he was ill, that I should come back to the college. And literally 25 years passed before I came back. It, uh, it was a remarkable experience when I came back because Ira was, was sick, he was in a wheelchair. And we had talked to each other quite a few times by telephone, but I had never seen him during that period of time. When I got to his house, he and and Mary and, the, and his children decided that we would go to a football game. And so we packed them into our car and we drove to the campus. When I got to the campus, the thing that kind of astounded me as I walked around is Ira tried to introduce me to every person that I met. And I was just confounded when I saw so many people of color. It was not the school that I remembered. It was not the place I remembered. There were so many more women, period. And they knew who I was, and I didn't know who any of them were. Ira kind of smiled at the whole process, and I realized that he had set me up. He had really wanted me to see the changes that had taken place. And ultimately, I decided to come back a little bit more often. And I came to an event where I briefly spoke, and there was a, a white female, older woman, um, who was present. She had, she had, I don't think she had graduated from the school, but I knew that she was a member of the Board of Trustees. And she was very, very just bright and witty. And as I talked, I noticed that she was crying. She was in tears. And I never thought about anybody ever understanding what my pain was other than Ira, because he had lived with, it, with me as had Mary, Ira's wife. But she seemed to be grieving. And she just walked up to me after it was over. I was putting the things in my bag, getting ready to get to the next session. And she just did something that was so graceful, was so powerful. She just put her arms around me and said, I'm sorry. And I was stunned by that. It was an act I thought of kindness and love. And I will never forget it because it opened up the door in my heart to find a place where I could understand forgiveness, could understand reconciliation. And it was the event that eventually led me back to the college. We all are like that in one way, shape or form or another. And meeting Janelle, meeting Patrick Stokes, other younger members of, of, of the college family who happened like me to be African-American and seeing and understanding that they all had this same separation phase where they left and came back, where they found new networks first outside of the college and then subsequently within the college is a good thing, meaning an opportunity for us to forgive, to move on and to make a place for ourselves with a similar leadership role within the community where we shared at least four years of our lives. And so, I just say to those of you who may be young, uh, younger, I'm now 72, not 16 when I first came to the college. Um, there is a place for you here. There has been a place for me. And it has been a shocking experience to rejoin the college community. But I'm glad I did. And I hope you'll join me. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um... I recently have had some experiences that have felt like reconciliation for me um, as recent events have uh, been a catalyst for me to become more vocal about my experiences uh, 
with racism, but also trying to hold McDaniel accountable to create an anti-racist future for students of color. Um, having alumni reach out and apologize that they weren't more vocal or active about things occurring on campus. Being able to connect with other alumni that are really active, like Lily, um, that's been really uh, reconciling for me and my experiences at McDaniel. I think it's important when we're talking about DEI work to not just focus on creating a better future and working towards a more anti-racist future and uh, dismantle, dismantling these systems that uphold white supremacy and institutional racism. That certainly is a part of DEI work and it's certainly important, but we must also reconcile with our past and the missed opportunities where we could have stepped up and been an ally for someone um, and also contribute to healing and restorative justice. I think that's also another really critical piece of the work that we're doing um, and how we can move forward. I'd also like to ask if anyone who's attending that has any questions that you can ask your question, you can type it in um, and we will get to that. Um, I would like to talk to Jose and Richard about your experience on campus. I know a lot of times when things happen, um, it can feel like statements are being made, um, work is alluded to, but maybe um, it might be a little difficult to see if change is really happening. So I'd love to hear um, what your experiences have been on campus in terms of working on um, DEI work, but also seeing some cultural changes that might be taking place. Richard, you could start, feel free. Sure. So first of all, I just wanna say thank you uh, for giving that, that outline, the history, uh, to hear even the vision of Dr. Zepp for 2020 and to know that a number of those things we are working on. Um, as I mentioned, I'm class of 2000 and um, had my separation period, but that there was also a time where I felt that I would like to come back and to help move our college even further in the right direction. And one of the things that um, from an academic standpoint that myself and a number of my colleagues decided that we needed to work on was the curriculum. And we recognized if we were gonna truly be a 21st century college that helps to intellectually as well as socially prepare um, our next generation or generations of leaders that we cannot continue to do things the same way. Uh, we can't research the same way, we can't explore knowledge the same way, nor even teach the same way uh, for too long not only at this college, but throughout this nation, we have centered the knowledge of Europeans and downplayed knowledge from other groups in ways that implicitly and at times explicitly have continued to reproduce and maintain the racist, sexist, and heterosexist beliefs that inform and justify inequities and reject inclusion. Um, in essence, we ta tacitly justify the systems and structures that we oppose and work to dismantle Understanding this, like I said, myself and a number of my colleagues have worked and are working to continue to decolonize the curriculum. Um, just very quickly what that means, that decolonizing curriculum requires really acknowledging the power dynamics, impact, and, or, uh, excuse me, of our perception and of our knowledge, in identifying systemic inequities in our current curriculum and pedagogy, but also exposing how the institution is structured to maintain colonial hierarchies as well as rethinking the current curriculum to make it more comprehensively inclusive. Uh, please don't get me wrong, this is not getting rid of knowledge produced by European males. Uh, it's decentering it from our curriculum because the ability to produce knowledge is not owned by any group. Uh, so to do this, we are currently in the midst of conversations, um, some even happening while I'm speaking and we're developing resources, a resource base to help faculty and administrators to understand what this means and how to do it effectively and um, 
are also developing trainings as well that will help our faculty to better decolonize their specific curriculum. Uh, we have a more diverse campus, that's, that's obvious. But what we have to do is work so that all of our students can see themselves represented in our curriculum. And that's the work that uh, we're doing, or some of the work that we're doing from uh, academic standpoint. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Jose Luis Moreno. My pronouns are he and his. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, thank you, Richard, for those words. Um, and just to kind of go off what Richard has saying, I work on the staff side, but um, I'm here for all students, faculty, and staff. Um, and uh, just, I started in 2016. And so I um, will give you a little bit of a history in terms of what I've seen and where we are going and what we are currently doing. Uh, and so um, in 2016, I walking into McDaniel, there was uh, a great sense uh, and understanding of the impact of students of color on campus, the need for to, di to diversify the faculty and the staff. Um, and it was, um, it was very uplifting for me, at least, to know that, that there was a need for it. And then also that there was an acknowledgement because uh, too often, um, there's a lot of discussion about the need to diversify and um, a lot of times that unfortunately are empty words uh, in, in our society in terms of um, just the look of it and how important it is, but not, not necessarily understanding the impacts and the need for it on, an, on, a, on a campus of higher education or even in our society as a whole. And so with that, um, I was empowered um, with that knowledge. I was empowered to really uh, start challenging the systems in place, not just on in McDaniel, but in the community, um, and uh, really start looking at um, what types of programs our students were, were looking for in our faculty and staff. And so one of my goals was not just to program for students, but with students. And so that for me was, um, essential piece because we needed to, I fully understood that there was a need to listen and to really understand where the students were coming from, what they needed and how they wanted to address these issues. And so um, when my first year, I, we did, I, I was at a department of one and um, we, I did about 16 programs and you fast forward to now we're doing about, last year we did 53 programs um, not including trainings. Uh, and um, from there, though, we also implemented, uh, the first year we implemented a, uh, uh, the EDGE Experience Mentorship Program. And that was also an initiative that was um, an answer or at least uh, uh, a path to the understanding that we didn't just need to diversify the institution, but we also wanted to make clear that we were here to support and to put uh, structures in place to help these students succeed. And so the EDGE Mentorship Program is a mentorship program that focuses on students from Baltimore City Public Schools. And it, it is in its fifth year. Um, it has an 80% retention rate. Um, and it also allows students to um, interact with current students. So these are first year students that interact with, with current students, their mentors. Um, and just a note too, that this, this program also uh, was initiated by Mr. Vic McTeer. Uh, he, uh, I don't know if he recalls, but there was a lot of conversations right before I, I started with the then uh, Vice President of Student Affairs. And this really um, was spearheaded by him. And so the impact that he has and has had on this institution is it's just uh, amazing to me that, um, you know, five years, well, five years later, this program has, has really um, had a great impact on our students. And from there, um, there has also been uh, strives within the institution um, to look at some of the systemic issues. So from there, the Faculty Inclusion Diversity Committee uh, started. Uh, and uh, within that committee, there's also been work on a diversity statement, on trainings, uh, purposeful to, uh, uh, looking at the topics of equity and inclusion. And this is not just this past year. I mean, the FIDC has been around for the last three to four years. 
And so um, there has been a reactive, but also a proactive approach. Uh, and then from uh, this past summer, some of the issues that we've seen and the societal uh, challenges that we've been facing uh, within the scope of, of race and uh, racism, the uh, Board of Trustees Task Force for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion was initiated. And then from there, um, the other part of this is that I just want to back up a little bit that the institution fully understood that it was a community approach, that it couldn't just be the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. It couldn't be just certain groups of committees or, or, or individuals doing this work. And um, from there, the task force started the advisory board, the DEI div uh, advisory board that was, again, uh, specific and intentional about bringing in alumni of color, not just alumni of color, but staff and faculty to be on this board with uh, board trustee members to really uh, take a look at what the issues are and how to support and, and, and fix these issues. Um, and then there was, and then also there's the diversity equity uh, administrative team that is comprised by the president, uh, key administrators, um, VPs and different departments, uh, individuals from different departments to really, again, allow it to be a, a, a full community effort. And then also from there, a couple of years ago, um, the, the uh, Dr. Deborah Johnson Ross Study Abroad uh, Endowed Grant was also initiated. And this is specifically um, to give a shout out to the Budapest campus or McDaniel. Uh, they're also doing efforts and implementing efforts to diversify their program. Uh, and this grant does help that because the grant is focused on uh, assisting students of color to uh, financially to uh, study abroad. And so again, I just wanna um, really uh, uh, give the importance to that we are really focusing on the issue at hand, that it, it, it is systemic, that it is a problem, and that um, the school, the college as a whole is really taking it as seriously as possible, but also understanding that this is a process and that we do not want it to be where um, it's just a one and done and we did a couple committees and then two or three years from now we are it's over. I think that um, given the importance of this and, and the knowledge that it is a continuous process, um, I think that the, the college also has an opportunity now uh, with the, the um, with Dr. Casey retiring at the end of this year that there we will be focusing on um, bringing in and selecting a president that has that mindset that wants to take McDaniel into the future uh, with the focus that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a systemic issue, that has systemic issues, and that uh, they will um, empower our students, our faculty, and our staff to bring it to um, to a forefront and to make diversity, equity, and inclusion an everyday uh, initiative, not just when there are issues that arise. And so um, I am very, very empowered to do the work I do because of that knowledge that as an institution, we are moving forward together. And that, and that I believe just in this, and uh, in, in during this program, you'll, you'll see that and you've heard that hopefully from all the individuals speaking that we are committed to the success of McDaniel um, and the focus of diversity, equity, and inclusion on our society. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, so much good work is going on. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear from you, Marty, about your perspective as a board member and um, some experiences that you shared with us the other day. Thank you, Janelle. Um, as I shared at the beginning, I've been a member of the Board of Trustees for a very long time. And I also chaired the board from 2007 through 2018. And, and thinking back uh, near the end of President Coley's presidency in 2009-2010, there began an effort to increase the diversity of our student body. And this really ramped up over the next 10 years during President Casey's uh, tenure. And this conscious effort was something that we have been very quick to applaud ourselves in accomplishing. Um, we are always sharing the number of students of color that make up our class. And 
first generation. And as proud as we've been of our accomplishment, we really had not gone beyond diversifying the student body. There, there was not a comparable focus on the diversity in our faculty, our administration, and all manner of support. But McDaniel basically continued to function as a white institution. The death of George Floyd has opened all eyes to this issue. Suddenly, we seem to open new eyes and new doors to resources of, in the college to be able to recruit higher top rated applicants of color. And I don't mean to say that we were ever discriminating in our hiring. It's just we were not looking with a focus for qualified applicants of color and thinking outside of the box. Now, as Richard and Jose have shared, the work that they're doing and need, needed to adapt our current to our current constituency and provide support for them has become a very, very large focus. On a personal note, I've always thought of myself as being racially open and accepting of all people. Well, 18 months ago, I met and started dating an African-American lady, Janice. Again, just someone that I found myself attracted to that happened to be African-American descent. As we communicated in my terms, I quickly became aware of how inappropriate my terms are. I used the term colorblind only to learn how insulting the term is to people of color. Countering Black Lives Matters with All Lives Matters seemed a logical statement until I recognized through reading, watching video chats, TED Talks, listening to the voices of alumni at McDaniel College that historically, Black lives have just not mattered which is why we need to focus on Black Lives Matters and communicate that McDaniel is a campus where Black Lives Matter. The truth is, I took offense when Janice shared her personal fear of being out alone in Carroll County at night. She's lived most of her life in Columbia, Maryland, um, only to learn that this is and has been an ongoing concern for McDaniel College alumni of color. While driving black can still be a problem in Carroll County today. We're engaged now looking for a break in COVID to set a wedding date. I believe many of my white peers are exactly where I was and just as naive on racial matters as I was. And I don't believe that there is a conscience, a consciousness among a lot of my white peers of exactly how their words are taken. Now, I serve on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force. The task force is listening to alumni of all generations, faculty, administrators, students, all constituents of McDaniel College with the goal of educating our trustees to develop an inclusive long range plan. As we approach a presidential transition, we can set the path forward. We've invited a broad demographic of students to McDaniel's party. Let's invite them to dance. Thank you. And I, um, you know, if I, if I have just one moment, I did forget to mention, and I apologize that when I mentioned in terms of the community efforts, that also includes the graduate program. Um, and so we have a new dean, uh, Dean Vicki Mazur, 
and she's doing great work. Um, she actually also has and instilled a uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee to really look at some of the issues within the graduate program and concerns and also try to do better in terms of moving forward with the institution as a whole. So I, I even missed out to mention that, that this is again a community effort and the graduate program is part of our community. Thank you so much. And thank you, Marty, for sharing your perspective and your own experience and learning more about how you can be a more supportive ally. I would agree that a lot of people probably find themselves where you did 18 months ago. Um, and I really hope that, you know, you sharing your experience can encourage them to do the learning and the work that will help them help us move McDaniel towards becoming a better institution, an even better institution. Some of you might be wondering how you can help support efforts. Um, Heidi has graciously uh, shared her contact information and Heidi, I'm gonna ask if you can put your email address in the chat so that everyone can see it. Um, if you're interested in sharing ideas, sharing experiences, I think people would be interested in connecting with you. Um, but the work goes beyond just work at McDaniel. I think that we have to uh, do all that we can to support McDaniel in furthering this work and creating um, a community that is not just seeking to increase diversity, um, but also to create an environment that truly supports people of color um, and helps them thrive. And one way to do that is in your own community. So a lot of us are joining, um, maybe we're not still located close to McDaniel, um, so I wanted to invite Lily today because Lily has been extremely active in this space in their own community and um, I wanted Lily to share their experience and some of the work that they've been doing to give ideas on how you might be able to go about um, being an agent of change in your community. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me on here. I was really honored to, to be asked to be on here. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, kind of going back to what Janelle just said, you know, she, you know, she took the words right out of my mouth, you know, where it's not just about the amount of diversity that there is or, um, you know, if we're including, whether or not we're including people, but for, for me, um, the most important part of this work is the equity piece. Um, and you can't really have <laughs> that diversity. You shouldn't want to have that diversity or inclusion without the equity already having some kind of foundation with that, you know, because then you're just inviting people into a space where they're not comfortable um, and there can be a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of... Um, you know, you're just not putting people in, in very good situations. And, um, you know, something, that, you know, that Vic um, and, and Jose, I know, talked about was just, you know, you wanting to see yourself represented and coming from the LGBTQ community, um, you know, you, you want to see, your, I'm going into, you know, in firefighting, like I want to, I want to see my, myself represented in the places where I'm learning these things and I don't right now. And, and so right now, like it can be very, it's an example of just it being very challenging to create that space um, and making it comfortable, but it, it's, it's not, it won't be like that. But also, um, you know, I, I love what Jose said about not just, you know, doing things for the students, but working with this, with the students and, you know, we're talking about community right now. Um, you can be doing all this like work and you can post or do all these things to, um, you know, spread awareness, but really you have to do a self audit of, of your, com of yourself and your community. Um, you know, ask, asking yourself like, do where, where are, people that are different from me in my community? Um, am I already around them or do I just not have them at all? Um, what are the commonalities that I have, um, you know, either work-wise, um, like politically, job-wise with, you know, BIPOC and, and, you know, others. But 
uh, kind of doing that self audit to start is, is super, super important. And then you can go from there. Um, and, and you don't have to insert yourself into their spaces at all. In fact, you should, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing that, you know, as white people, um, there are certain spaces that are just not for us and that is fine. Um, but there are spaces that we have to share, like going to a town hall meeting or, um, you know, at your job or, you know, if you have a hobby of something that you really enjoy. For me, like I inline skate and it's a really accessible sport for a lot of people. Um, and, uh, you know, I was able to be a part of a, a community and, um, you know, find a protest support group called Wheels for Equality, where um, that's my, my greater community. And that's just, that's just in my, like, my hobbies. Like, that's like, that's my hobby is skating, but I found a way um, to really put my hobby into the community and have it be for a, a, a bigger purpose, um, just in myself, but, and getting, you know, better at skating. It's like, okay, I'm out skating, um, but also, you know, we go and, um, I'm just giving some ideas here, but we, we are a protest support group in the sense that we are out there, um, to increase safety of people protesting in Charlotte, um, and, uh, you know, be at the front and the back and make sure the streets are safe for our, our walking protesters. You know, that's just one thing. Um, but when you do go into those mutual spaces, uh, and, and you haven't really, you know, you could find yourself just not having BIPOC in your life at all. And when you do go into those spaces that you share, um, you know, you can initiate the, that first step and it doesn't have to be undermining. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, white saviorism. That's kind of weird, you know, to, to, to do that. But, you know, just straight up having a conversation um, with a person at your town hall meeting and being like, hey, like, are you doing okay? Like, do you feel supported by what our, um, our, our local government is doing for us as a community, for you and your community? Like, do you feel comfortable? Um, do you need, do you, is there something that would make you more comfortable? Um, and, you know, people have different cultures. So like, there's going to be cultures where it's like, the, you know, and we talk about the issue being really systemic, like the system was created for white people like our system is like was created for 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 white people ultimately and i know that's kind of radical to say but it, it was and um i think that being able to recognize that go into those situations and proclaiming right off the bat you know um you know or right off the bat like one you have compassion for this person's situation because you've been in a situation yourself where you've been uncomfortable you haven't felt um safe you know like everyone's had that situation so you need to put that that um that lens over it of a BIPOC and and what they've experienced and how that on top of your not being comfortable what their level of, of discomfort might be um but you know, you, you got to be clear, um, you know, from the beginning, hey, I know I'm not perfect. You know, you're not going to be perfect in these spaces. Um, you know, from the get go, you can say like, please let me know if there's something I'm saying that I'm doing that's problematic to you. Like, I am not, I'm not going to become defensive. Um, you know, I'm going to be open to listen. And then on the flip side of that, being actually being really willing to listen um and, and being willing to um you know make those changes and not just hear them and like listen but you know really really listen and really try to make those changes in yourself um when you recognize the privilege that you have as a white person um you know you it, we, you have to use that privilege because what going back to how you know i i started out but equity being first and foremost out of everything here um just you know you want the space to feel equally as comfortable for someone that's different than you that and yourself like you can exist in those spaces um and not just have it be diversity and ha have to you know keep having 
what that whiteness be the the driving factor it has to be in, all encompassing in everyone's culture kind of all all together um but yeah just really making sure that you are not insert overly inserting yourself in those spaces but finding those common grounds and finding those spaces that you share with BIPOC and um and and just start a conversation treat them treat them treat treat people like people um you know so but you, everyone can do that everyone lives somewhere where you know it's not it's not like you don't have any black people where you live like everyone does so it's not like you can't make your space safe for everyone uh, so thank you thank you lily for sharing your experience and i see that heidi uh put the link uh in the chat uh to check out wheels for equality which is the group that lily was referencing um so i see that adriana i'm hoping that i'm pronouncing your name right uh is curious about how to become more active and support McDaniel in reaching its DEI goal. So if you reach out to Heidi, Heidi put her email in the chat, she can get you connected with the appropriate channels so that you can support. We definitely need all hands on deck uh, for this work. So we're excited that you're wanting to get involved. Um, I see that we're, we're going over time a little bit. So I want to uh, just open the floor to all of the panelists today for any closing comments that they have and then I'll turn it over to Vic to give us some words of wisdom on our way forward. Thank you, Janelle. I just want to quickly close, <clears throat> at least for my thoughts, is that um, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone that has spoken today um, and everybody that's been attending and asking questions on the chat. Um, I um, I'm very happy to see all the, the hard work we're doing is paying off and, and that people are really interested in making it a better place for all students in the future. Um, but lastly, I just want to uh, say that the, the key thing that I'm taking away from this program is that I've heard throughout the program how important and how many times we've heard and someone speak about community. And I just want to point out that um, you can't have community without unity. Literally, it's in it's it's in the word, and so we we can't come together uh, if there are certain people that feel they're not part of the community. And so we have to be unified in our goals. We have to be unified in our support. We certainly have to be unified in appreciating and respecting individuals. And if one person is not um, respected or feels that they are left out, then there is no unity. And ultimately, there is not, there isn't a community, um, and we at McDaniel value that value community, and uh, we want to make sure that we are unified in that goal and that hope for all of us. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I mean, to wrap up my experience at McDaniel. I, I haven't been back in a while, and um, something I I don't love about my experiences that I felt as though campus um, was was relatively segregated when I was there and I that that makes me really sad because I missed out on some really incredible you know relationships that I could have formed um, with other with other people who you know we share the same either values or interests or um, you know viewpoints um, but also different from me so I'm really happy that y'all have put things together like this um, to include everyone and to make those spaces, you know, a lot safer for um, our, our, our students that are, are going through McDaniel. So thank, thank you guys for, for putting this together. Any other closing remarks before we turn it over to Vic? All right. Vic, if you would, give us some words of wisdom for our way forward and how we move together, unified as a community. You're still muted. We can't afford to miss any of your words. Thank you all so much for this opportunity to join with you. Um, Lily, you said a few things that really hit me hard and I wanna address 
these comments, not just to you, but particularly to Richard and Jose and other faculty members. Um, the worst problem I had when I was at McDaniel was going home. And it became a difficult problem because of the fact I, after I'd been on McDaniel campus for two years, I had been so separated from the place I called home. It was like I was going to a foreign government, you know, <laughs> but for mom, <laughs> you know, um, I felt as if I was really enduring a all white scenario. And that my goals were no longer related to the community that I was born and raised in. And so there was a struggle that went on for me personally on how to re-enter that community. And it was a very difficult struggle. Um, and so when you spoke, Lily, I knew exactly what you're talking about. And I wanted to share with you that is not something only white people suffer. <laughs> but when you move to a place that's so different from everything you've known, wow, it can be very, very uh, culturally difficult. And you know, what happened was I got to Mississippi. And Mississippi was the place where I lived in, in the Mississippi Delta that was, I mean, literally eight out of every 10 people you see walking down the street are black. I immersed myself in a black culture, I immersed myself in black values, some of which were very different from quote, middle class values that I was born and raised with. I learned what it was like to live in a poor man's house learn how to understand certain terminologies that I hadn't experienced before, learn how not to be so insulting to poor folk, insulting, learned how to be a servant. It's a good place to start in anybody's community. And it changed my whole life and the way in which I saw the world. Many of you are going to have that same option that same opportunity. Richard, you use a term that I'll never forget, um, the decolonization <laughs> of a curriculum. I didn't know what the hell you were talking about. It was really remarkable. <laughs> but I keep everything, Marty, I, you know, I'm, I, I keep everything I got. And upstairs in this house in Key West, I found a report that I wrote to graduate for the political science department at McDaniel College. It was written in 1968. It was on employment discrimination at McDaniel College. And it was wonderful. You know, I could see there that I'm sitting there writing stuff that I would eventually write as a lawyer, you know? Somehow or another, William David, a white professor, was decolonizing the curriculum of political science at Western Maryland College just because this black kid refused to be taught what they wanted to teach. You're going to have to show me how that helps. These are the kind of questions that we ought to be teaching people at McDaniel to be able to ask. It is the essence of a liberal arts education so that when I hear you talk, Janelle, about some of the impacts of your work, I mean, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear. I am just so impressed with all of you. And I hope that you know just how much this means to cross these generational lines and talk to people who weren't even born at the time that I went to McDaniel College. Thank you all for this afternoon. Thank you for these opportunities. And let's just keep talking. Thank you for those words, Vic. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining. I think I speak for all of us uh, when I say that we look forward to continuing this work and these conversations. So enjoy the rest of our first virtual homecoming and stay safe. <laughs>